Many people are asking me, how do I lower DHEA levels? My name is Dr. Taranella, and I've gotten this question several times in the last couple months since I've published a few videos on DHEA levels. So this is a first in multiple videos on how to go about lowering DHEA levels. We'll talk about specific tactics you can do to lower your DHEA levels in each of these. Now, many times high DHEA levels is a sign that you could be having other things going on. So if you haven't been checked out for PCOS and things like this, you should be evaluated further for this. So if this is something that interests you, don't forget to click on the like button and subscribe to the channel to get more videos like this. Now, if you want to give more financial support to the channel, there's a link in the description for PayPal. You can donate as much as you want. Any amount is appreciated. All right, well, let's look at how to lower DHEA levels. Okay, how do I lower DHEA levels? So the approach to lower your DHEA levels will vary based on the reason that it is high to begin with. Your body is a complex system of overlapping layers of feedback inhibition, meaning one thing causes something which then feeds back to inhibit the same thing that caused it. And so understanding your particular system takes patience, lots of testing, and clinical experience. With that in mind, I'll do my best to explain how I would approach or go about lowering DHEA. So for this video, or I should say multiple videos, uh, when I say DHEA, I'm referring to DHEA sulfate. So I've broken it down into, uh, so far, into three main categories of causes, and there will be three separate videos so far. It may expand if we get into it further, but we'll look at a few different approaches to lower the DHEA levels based on what the cause is. So each one will have a kind of a separate way to look at lowering it. All in all, the idea here is that there's either too much coming in or not enough coming out. So if that's happening, either one of those uh, can offset the flux of DHEA, leading to higher DHEA levels in the middle. We're going to look at the different things that are known to influence that which is coming in and that which is coming out. So one important note about this is that congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is a, a genetic disorder, uh, often presents with elevated DHEA levels because the enzyme that breaks down DHEA and turns it into something else is defective. And this is referred to as 3-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. So there are some other genetic things that can go on with that that are, are not exactly congenital adrenal hyperplasia that can also lead to uh, slightly elevated DHEA levels. You know, depending on how high your levels are, that may be something you need to be looking into. Seeing an endocrinologist would be appropriate, even in the case that, you know, it's not super high, you probably should be seeing an endocrinologist to see what they have to say. So as it goes for the incoming DHEA and the outgoing DHEA, the first thing that we want to talk about is the amount that's coming in. And one of the things that influences that is stress. So you may have heard this before. Uh, I did mention that in some of the other videos, but I wanted to give a little bit more detail on how this occurs and also what you can do about it. So each time cortisol is produced, DHEA is also produced. And that's because in the brain, there's a hormone called ACTH, which stimulates the adrenal glands. At the same time, it stimulates cortisol. It also stimulates DHEA production. So those two things are almost coupled together where you can't have one without the other. So the more stress you present with, the more DHEA production you're going to get. So the first step in figuring out if this is something that's relevant to your situation is to check your cortisol levels. So you already have your DHEA, you know that's high, but why is it high? If your cortisol levels are elevated, this suggests it could be at least part or one of the causes. Now, one cortisol test is not going to tell you definitively that that's the cause, but if you have multiple samples that are showing you're above the normal or close to the normal upper end of the reference range, this does suggest that. Now, there's different ways to check cortisol. There's morning AM cortisol. There's uh, just random serum cortisol, and there's 24-hour uh, urine tests. There's also salivary tests, um, which I won't comment too much on that because I don't use them very often. They can be helpful. I just don't use them, so I can't comment on them. So if your cortisol is in the upper range there uh, for the serum, usually it's around 16 or higher. That does suggest maybe this is a contributing factor. And you can uh, check multiple times because cortisol can be quite variable, can change from day to day depending on what's going on, you know, what you've eaten, things like that. So multiple samples are usually uh, helpful depending on the cl other clinical pictures and things like that. Okay, so what are we going to do about it? Now, keep in mind, 
you know, if you know your cortisol is high based, based on testing, that's one thing. If you don't know your cortisol is high, these things may actually hinder your progress or hurt. So don't go off of, well, I feel stressed, so therefore I have high cortisol. You really should check to know, and you should be checking with your doctor to make sure none of these things are going to interfere with any of the treatments that you may be currently doing or any other health issues you have. Generally, these things are safe, but this does not substitute for uh, medical care or seeing an actual doctor. So the first one that I'll mention is ashwagandha. So ashwagandha is in a category of herbs called adrenal adaptogens. There's multiple things that are in this category, but ashwagandha seems to be quite favorable in terms of how people respond to it. It's generally people do not have problems with it. And adaptogenic herbs work by balancing out the activity the activity that they work on. So in this case, it's adrenals and cortisol that they're helping balance out. So the cortisol activity, when it, when cortisol binds to the receptors, it has a certain uh, response to those receptors. And so ashwagandha can modulate that response. It can uh, block, if there's lots of cortisol, it can block that cortisol from binding. Um, and therefore you have less of that response. And it can also stimulate if you have low cortisol um, and boost it up a little bit. So that's called an adaptogen. And ashwagandha is a good adaptogen if you have high cortisol, it can really help that. It's kind of more on the mild side in terms of you know, helping this process if your cortisol levels are high. So there are multiple other herbs that can be used that are similar to ashwagandha. Another thing that I'll mention is zinc levels. So zinc uh, deficiency is often associated with high cortisol levels. Now that does not mean that, that uh, zinc deficiency causes high cortisol, but there is an association there. And so you may want to consider if your cortisol is high is checking your zinc levels as well, because that may be a contributing factor to the high cortisol and correcting that may help kind of dampen that response as well. Okay, and then I have one more to mention, and then we're going to talk about some general things to help with overall uh, cortisol and adrenal output. So holy basil is also an herb that can be used to lower cortisol. It has a stronger effect on dampening the cortisol levels than something like ashwagandha would. Then lastly, just a couple general notes. So cortisol levels are going to respond based on blood sugar. So when your blood sugar levels are really low, your cortisol levels are going to go up to mobilize the stored glucose called glycogen. And if you're uh, someone that's eating a lot of uh, refined carbohydrates, sugary things, and your body is overall metabolically inflexible because you're always eating like lots of carbs, like a high carb diet, and specifically more of the uh, simple carbs, you're going to have an up and down swing in your blood sugars and your cortisol is going to be also going up and down like that. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, you may want to look at if you have high cortisol and kind of aiming for this reduction in cortisol levels. Uh, the other thing is chronic health issues uh, oftentimes will cause higher cortisol levels depending on where you're at in the state of chronic health. But things like depression, for example, are often associated with high cortisol. And so be sure to look at those. And other thing to look at too is general self-care. You know, what's your support system? How do you de-stress from work or life? Do you have a sense of community and support or are you kind of isolated? Um, because these things are important in how you interpret the events and the happenings and the things that are going on in your life that may cause your, your, your brain to be more stressed and trigger more of that uh, ACTH production leading to this higher DHEA and cortisol. So these are all things to keep in mind if you do have high cortisol and that may be triggering your high DHEA levels. All right, so that will conclude this video on how do I lower DHEA levels. This is the first in multiple videos uh, that I'll be putting out on this topic. This one was specifically focused on stress and the impact of stress on DHEA levels. So if you like this information, click on the like button and subscribe to the channel. Thank you again for watching. We'll see you next time.